Welcome back, everyone. It's 2 p.m. on the East Coast, top of the hour, where almost everyone is, except for a few weird time zones elsewhere in the world that are on the half hour. Uh, I know it's been a long haul, and NHRI has a tradition of working everyone hard at a workshop. I hope people got a chance to eat. Uh, we do want to slightly switch gears from gathering information from the outside world to presenting you with some information about uh, NIH programs and projects uh, in the area. Um, so to that end, we have two speakers. Um, they're going to go one after another, and we will try to save the addressing of the questions to the end. I'll be monitoring the chat. So um, save your questions for both speakers to the end. So each speaker will take about 10 minutes, and that should leave us about 10 minutes for discussion time before we go into the final session. And so our first speaker today is uh, going to um, represent the UNITE program, which I'm sure we'll describe a bit about. Uh, and it's Leah Butler. Uh, Leah got her undergraduate degree from uh, University of Maryland, Baltimore County, an amazing institution that I've gotten to watch um, produce mm -hmm. really cool people over the last three, three decades almost, two and a half decades. Um, and then she has a law degree from the American University's Washington College of Law, and she's been at I NIH, been in the federal government for 14 years and at NIH for uh, most recently. And she's going to again talk about the UNITE initiative at the NIH. And then afterwards, and I'll introduce him, we'll have Kareem, Dr. Kareem Watson. So Leah, it's up. you're on, and I believe your slides are already started. Yes, thank you, thank you for having me. It is my distinct honor to represent the Chief Office for Diversity, Workforce Diversity, led by Dr. Marie Bernard. I am currently on a detail assignment from my home office in OHR, and I am getting great satisfaction with being involved in contributing to the efforts of UNITE. Um, so I'll get started here. So the UNITE initiative that got started was initiated and established and it was driven by the events of 2020, um, having to do with the disparate and mobility and mor mortality of COVID-19 pandemic, the murder of George Floyd and the killings of Asian women in Atlanta in 2021. This brought into sharp relief the ongoing reality of racial and ethnic injustice in our country, of course, and the responsibility on all of us to address this issue. And, and by that means, um, NIH could not remain silent and not address it in its own capacity. We developed a shared commitment to address structural racism in the biomedical research um, enterprise. So what is UNITE? The NIH UNITE initiative is made up of five committees. Each of the committees are tasked with their own respective charges. It's the U Committee that addresses understanding stakeholder experiences through listening and learning. There's the N Committee that has to do with new research on health disparities, minority health, and health equity. There's the I Committee that addresses improving the NIH culture and structure of equity, inclusion, and excellence. There's the T Committee having to do with transparency, communication, and accountability with our internal and external stakeholders. And then there's the E-Committee. It addresses external research ecosystem, changing policy, culture, and structure to promote um, workforce diversity. The UNITE Committee consists of NIH employees across the, in the, uh, the uh, ICs, the institutions, and centers. Each committee has a charge and in their respective charges, they consider initiatives, um, both short-term and long-term, which further unites missions to address structural racism within the biomedical research enterprise. To do so, there are three focus areas established. First, there's the health disparities, minority health and health equity research area. There's internal workforce focus area. And then there's the external workforce focus area. I will give you a synopsis of the action items that have um, occurred in each of these focus areas. The NIH um, has committed up to $58 million for um, awards um, for research, to further research. Um, 
uh, there has been a total of 11 awards. Six of these awards went towards transformative research to address health disparities and advance health equity. And then there were um, five awards having to do with transformative research to address health disparities, primarily um, and specifically having to do with the minority serving institutions. I will go over um, next uh, the internal workforce and the accomplishments that we've addressed in the internal workforce. The NIH has examined and included in the performance elements of the executive level, um, included in one of their, um, their, their elements of their performance appraisal plans, um, the issue of HHS's and NIH's diversity, equity, and inclusion and accessibility um, uh, uh, efforts that is included directly in their um, performance plans. This is what we're calling the racial and ethnic equity plan. It's a component again within the DEIA performance metrics and the executive level performance plan. The principles for the REAP success are include flexibility, where each executive customize a plan according to their IC's culture and their circumstances. Another component of this is um, learning, analyzing the progress and applying new knowledge to their plan that they've established and share it with best practices with other ICs. And then there's a component um, with regards to the REAP success having to do with reporting out the progress on a long-term and short-term measures. The NIH's commitment is, um, is, is evident with regards to them investing resources necessary to achieve and sustain the three overarching goals here having to do with the establishment and the maintaining of these REITs. I've identified here the process and where we are in establishing and implementation, just to give you a roadmap of where we've been and where we are now with establishing these REITs. Back in November, we received guidance through an independent contractor to help all of our IC executives um, you know, establish and determine where they're going with establishing their REITs. Between November and April 1st, they've been given direct, iteratively establishing gu guidance to establish, prepare, and assess and design their REITs, right? These, those REITs were due April 1st. And right now we're in the process now of reviewing all of these REITs to ensure um, compliance with criteria that was established to ensure accountability and maintenance in order so that we can be on target for implementation on May 1st. It is the expectation that these REAPs will be uh, reported out on, um, on an annual basis. And again, best practices will be shared. Another initiative having to do with the internal workforce has to do with the power of inclusive, um, uh, is the uh, workforce recognition project. This is a project that was the brainchild of Sedona Jackson, who currently serves on the T committee. From her perspective and from all of our perspectives, she, um, you know, walking the halls of NIH, she didn't find any, anyone, any representative of the diverse workforce of NIH. And she came up with this initiative where we lined the walls, spent a great deal of funds to identify NIH, diverse NIH workforce throughout the halls of the NIH throughout the entire campus. I'm giving you a few slides to show before and after as far as you could see the change happening as it relates to this initiative. Initially, you would see in building one, former NIH directors. This is a before, but now with the implementation of this inclusive workplace recognition project, so the, the halls are now lined with representation of the diverse workforce of NIH. We went through great lengths with regards to identifying color schemes and, and palettes and patterns to, again, give the idea of diversity. Here are a couple of slides, Sadana here, giving a walkthrough to executive level management. You could see these, um, this, these exhibits through at least three of the buildings on NIH's main campus. Again, this is another um, exhibit and an idea of this initiative incorporating throughout the halls and changing the, um, the look, the image, you know, the, the idea of 
who we are and how we are stronger together. This is a, a slide identifying in one of the hallways um, since um, you know, a, a more diverse um, management, executive level management um, that has been installed um, through the prior, um, the prior head of the NIH, Dr. Collins, and give our workforce an idea of the path of diversity that has occurred over time. And in the future, there's even future planning to, um, to expand on this effort with online digital campaign and social media campaign um, in order to further and sustain this initiative. Right now, the committee is looking at ways in order to expand um, beyond the three buildings in which this initiative has um, started. So I'm coming now to the third focus area, the external workforce. And with this, we, um, there was um, the establishment of the first, um, the first project, the Falcony um, Institution, my, I have something, the Falcony Institutional Recruitment for Sustainable Transformation. This is the first program. The overarching goal here is to create cultures of inclusive excellence. The program objective here is Falcony cohort model for hiring, multi-level mentoring, professional development. Um, another objective here is integrated institution-wide systems to address bias, faculty, equity, mentoring, and work-life issues. And then there's a third objective, Coordination and Evaluation Center, the CEC, which is an independent program evaluation for faculty and institutional level. There has been an estimated $241 million that was, um, uh, that was committed um, over a period of nine years. Another program includes the um, Inclusive Excellence Best Practices, the Distinguished Scholars Program, the DSP. It was built upon a, a program in place, the Statman and Lasker Investigators Program, and it's a self-reinforcing community of PIs devoted to diversity and inclusion. Excuse me, I'm having difficulty with my computer. You can see over time as evident at, with the establishment of this program an, an, increase in, um, an, an, an increase in underrepresented minority um, um, uh, 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 PIs um, over time with the establishment of these two programs. Next, I'd like to highlight the um, institutional cultural change, the cohorts that were first um, included with um, this initiative. There's Cornell University, Drexel, Florida State University, uh, San Diego State University, Tuskegee, the University of Alabama at Birmingham, and the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai. The Morehouse School of Medicine was awarded over $58,000 in order to investigate the disparities or the effects of COVID on African Americans. Going over some future or anticipated future opportunities here include the um, expansion of the Science Education Partnership Awards, the CEPA program, to be NIH-wide. Um, there's plans to strengthen diversity and mentoring language and parent training grant and fellowship, FOA, funding opportunity announcement. Um, increase the use of diversity sup supplements for SBIR awards launch programs to fund excellence and DEIA investigators grants, um, launch a program to provide support for institutions to conduct objective climate assessments and critical self-studies, then develop action plans based on the results, launch prize for institutional innovation and advancement in DEI. And in order to do this, in order that, you know, the basis of all of these initiatives has been with getting information from where it counts. Um, the NIH sought input on how it can advance DEI and advance health disparities research with a request for information. And this 
um, was open, this RFI was open from the period of March 1st through April 23rd. Here are some of the uh, uh, RFI categories that were examined. All aspects of the biomedical workforce, policies and partnerships, research areas, and further ideas. These were the areas of categories in which input was requested. The results of the RFI, um, there was a resounding um, response rate from the academia. We received over 1,100 responses and a wide range of respondents spanned across sectors with the majority of the respondents being from academia. As you can see here, that was 46% from academia. And there were three preliminary cross-cutting um, you know, topics or findings that emerged from this RFI. And they are you know, actions beyond words. The responses included enhanced programs and activities. And then the, there's no way, there's no easy button. A small number, um, it should be noted, a small number of respondents perceived that there were no issues with racism or EDI at NIH and the broader bio, biomedical community. We, we, we I'm should, sorry. Uh, we should wrap up. Uh, okay, so I was just going over the um, next steps, and then I'm at the end of the presentation. If you need, I've only given you a brief synopsis of all the initiatives that Unite has accomplished, and if for more, I refer you to our website. And that's Thank it. Thank you very much uh, for that presentation. As we said, we're going to combine the the. The question session uh, after Kareem is done. So our next speaker is Kareem Watson. He is the Chief Engagement Officer at NIH's All of Us Research Program, and he was recently recruited to the NIH uh, just this fall. Uh, Kareem holds uh, two, two master's degrees, one in public health, one in math and science, and a um, PhD in, in health sciences, and he has had long-term experience uh, in community involvement and community engagement. And as he'll tell us, the All of Us program uh, is uh, an example that can be held up as soon as everyone says it's hard to recruit diverse um, folks to research uh, because they've done it, uh, it amazingly well. And Kareem is gonna tell us about that now. So go ahead, Kareem. Thank you so much. Um, I'm really excited to be here today. You, you, you're absolutely right. Um, the All of Us Research Program, as may, some may, may or may not be aware, came out of the Precision Medicine Initiative of 2015. And so we're right at the cusp now of being able to talk about the advances that we've made in genomics research. And we're really excited because through intentional efforts of community engagement and outreach, and through intentional efforts of ensuring that we include community partner, community members, as well as our participants as partners, we've been able to achieve something that we think is truly unprecedented in terms of diversity, equity, and inclusion. So I'm just gonna walk you through some brief achievements of the All of Us Research Program, where we're going to date, and then I'd love to engage in some questions with the audience. Next slide. So as noted, you'll see this slide here. So to date, as of March 15th, we have enrolled about 477,000 participants in the All of Us Research Study. And of those 477,000 participants enrolled, we actually have Data, full data on 329,000 participants. So of those 329,000 participants, that puts us almost at that halfway mark of getting to our goal of 1 million participants. So unlike other research studies where they're asking a question about a particular intervention or looking at a specific disease entity, the All of Us Research Program is setting out to build one of the nation's most diverse data sets of 1 million or more people. And our hope is that in that 1 million or more people that we attract, to enroll in the All of Us Research Program, that we're able to ensure that we represent the rich diversity of the US. So we've, we talk a lot in the program about what we call quadruple diversity. Of course, we want diversity in terms of race and ethnicity, but we also want diversity in terms of geography, disease types, as well as age. And so we've been able to achieve in our participants to date over 80% what we call underrepresented in biomedical research. When we say underrepresented in biomedical research, we mean populations that have historically been underrepresented in terms of race and ethnicity, but also including populations like sexual and gender minorities, populations that live in rural areas, populations that are older than 65. And there was even um, discussions earlier on in, in today's uh, breakout sessions from the report back about the need to include populations
population that are living with disabilities. And because unlike some studies that have strict inclusion and the exclusion criteria, the All of Us has been able to build this diverse data set because currently our only inclusion criteria is based on age and your ability to um, sign an informed consent form. But right, but we, we're soon going to be launching our pediatric enrollment, which we're excited about as well. But I want to draw your attention to this slide where of the 477,000 participants enrolled, 80% are underrepresented in biomedical research, but 50% are underrepresented racial ethnic minorities, which is a huge, a huge accomplishment. 24% of our population is greater than 65, 11% have less than a GED, 28% have annual incomes less than 25,000, and 9% sexual and gender minorities. If you compare that to historical genomic studies, where over almost 80% of participants are white or European ancestry, 10% are Asian. 2% African, 1% Hispanic, and 0.5% other minorities, and 8.5% underreported. You can see if the All of Us is achieving unprecedented numbers in terms of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Next slide. And But we're also in, in really interested, um, Lawrence talked about the fact that I recently joined the NIH from coming from academia. And one of the things that we, was, we always talked about in, in academia, and I'm excited to see some of my colleagues here on this call today, is the important that the messenger matters as well, right? And what I mean by that is that while we've achieved these unprecedented numbers in terms of diversity, equity, and inclusion, we want to make sure that our research workforce reflects this as well. And we do have a ways to go when it comes to our diversity and our research workforce. We've, been, we've achieved some great diversity in terms of career level. Lots of graduate students are now accessing our database and lots of research fellows and early career stage faculty. But we still have to make sure that we increase the number of African-American researchers. Currently, we have about 6.9% African-American researchers and about um, in, in terms of our Hispanic research, it's only about at 9%. So we are, we are being very intentional in ensuring that we do outreach and engagement with the research community as well to ensure that we achieve the same level of diversity and inclusion that we've achieved in our participant enrollment that we achieve in our research or engagement. Next slide. So the, the enrollment and the intentionality that we've had around our participants has not been by happenstance. For example, I wanna highlight here Two, two important types of community health centers that we include. So a lot of research studies include academic medical centers, right? We know when you think about cancer clinical trials and genomic studies, academic medical centers are typically where those studies are conducted. Studies typically aren't conducted in the community health centers where the majority of Americans receive their care particularly those health studies are not conducted in federally qualified health centers and community health centers. At the onset, all of us has been committed to ensuring that we not only engage those major academic medical centers, which play a very pivotal role in genomics research, but we've also been committed to including federally qualified health centers from the onset. And for example, I highlight here two FQHCs, one is San Ysidro Health in California, the other is Jackson Hines in Mississippi area. These two health FQHCs are just examples of the many FQHCs that we have around the country that are helping us engage diverse participant populations. For example, my academic career was primarily done through implementation science and community-based participatory research in a group of federally qualified health centers in the Chicagoland area. And it was at that time in working in those, these local FQHCs that I really, really I understood that FQHCs were often an afterthought when it came to research. Oftentimes, the research studies were not designed to, uh, to go along with our, our patient flow. And as a result, we often were excluded from participating in research studies. So the fact that all of us is intentional in including community sites such as FQHCs, as well as the VA health centers and others is one of the reasons why we've been able to get to the level of diversity that we've been able to achieve. Next slide. But also the power of community engagement. I can't say enough about community engagement. It was really through the the brainchild of our former, our founding chief executive officer, Eric Dishman, and now our, in the support of our current chief CEO, Josh Denny, that we've been able to include community as partners. We have unprecedented way of supporting community members. For example, in our engagement office alone, we provide community engagement awards to over 100 community partners. These 100 community partners vary from organizations like the National Alliance for Hispanic Health, the Black Greek Letter Consortium, several HBCU partners, historically Black college universities, and the Asian Health Coalition. For example, the, the partnerships with the Asian Health Coalition has allowed us to really make advances in including um, underrepresented Asian populations in our research, but then also thinking about the way that we do community engagement to build trust. For example, many some 
we talked about the work that we're doing with the University of Alabama and Tuskegee University, that's really going to allow us to think about those populations in the South that have been historically underrepresented. But you'll see here just a snapshot of some of the national organizations that we're working with to truly engage communities. And it's really been an amazing opportunity for us to center community engagement as the heart of the program. Next slide. And I talked earlier about our research engagement efforts. So I'm really excited about the work that we're doing with historically black college universities, HBCUs, as well as work that we're doing with organizations, universities like Baylor College of Medicine. We're setting out to ensure that we partner with organizations that can provide the type of mentoring, the resources and support to institutions that have been historically underrepresented in research. For example, that picture there on the left is me giving a Saturday morning lecture to researchers and graduate students at Xavier University. I mean, it was really excited to partner with Xavier because currently in order to, our data is accessible to three levels, three public, three levels. First is a publicly available data that anyone can go on and get access to that data in, even right now. Then there's the register tier. And then there's recently the control tier and I'll talk more about that control tier. But in our level of um, our public, our access to the register tier, researchers actually have to register and get access to our Python. One of the things we found out is that a lot of health disparities researchers do not code using our Python. And so we, through intentional efforts and partnerships with Baylor University, RTI and others, we're now making sure that we have support for R and Python use so that that will not become an exclusionary factor for researchers getting access to our database. Next slide. So another thing is that we also understand that the engagement of diverse populations, just like when you think about engaging diverse communities in research, I always say that when you think about building, addressing trust and building trust, that those partnerships have to begin before you want to engage communities in research. We feel that same way about engaging students in research. You have to pique that interest early on. I'm here because I was part of a pipeline program through our Urban League back when I was in high school. And that pipeline program exposed me to STEM researchers early on in my career. And it let me see people that looked like me that was doing this work. We're trying to do those similar efforts in the All of Us Research Program. This is an example of our, our minority student and research program that we had for the second year in a row where we actually are launching a minority scholarship scholars program where, where my undergraduate from undergraduate to postdoc students can sign up to become an All of Us Scholar and they'll be given res, um, research through support, they'll be given a mentor, and they'll be given an opportunity to also understand how to engage in genomics and health disparities research. But this is also a way for us to ensure that those that are accessing the data from our research, again, are thinking about this commitment to diversity and inclusion. To date, we have over 1,228 active projects on our research workbench, and I'll talk more about that. Next slide. This is an example of a study that's, that was conducted in our, our research workbench by Dr. Paulette Ch Chandler at Boston, um, in the Boston area. Dr. Chandler noted that through the demonstration project that they were able to conduct, we were able to validate the hypertension algorithm that was established by an eMERGE 3 study and prove the validity of the All of Us data set as a tool for developing and testing other rule-based algorithms. The reason that I highlight this is because Dr. Chandler said that it was the size and the diversity of the All of Us research data set that allowed her to validate this algorithm. And we want to make sure that researchers know that the secondary data set, the, the secondary data set that we have through the All of Us research program can be an effective tool for, for studies like that was conducted like by Dr. Chandler. Next slide. So the, I want to leave you with the actual what happened last month. Last month, we did something unprecedented as well. We launched the release of our genomics data. Our genomics data is currently available through our control tier. And our control tier actually recently um, reported out 98,600 whole genome sequences with 165,000 genotype arrays with over 500 million unique variants. And, and what this is going to allow us to do is going to, and when you think about this data, the of the 98,600 plus whole genome sequences, over 50% of these participants re represent, of this data is from racial and ethnic minorities. Again, unprecedented diversity, equity, and inclusion uh, in our data set. And we've been able to do this through our intentional efforts with our community partners. And in the chat, I believe my colleagues are putting up information about how you can learn more about our researcher workbench. And now I think we're at the point we can open it up to questions, Lawrence. Yes, sir. 
you're muted. Okay. Sorry. God, after two years, you think we would be able to do this. Um, I just wanted to mention that there are resources, important resources in, in being put in the chat. And I believe you, there are some from Unite that we will probably pop in there pretty soon. Uh, so for those of you that are just hearing about these programs for the first time, take a look at the chat and the links there. Importantly, there's an all of us research general page, but if you there's a lot of researchers here and you may or may not know, but you have access to a certain level of this data today if you want to. Um, and it's going to be pretty amazing as it goes forward. So I, I would encourage you to register to be a researcher and spread this information around because it is really democratic and available to anyone who wants to it at the, at the open tier and very low bar to get into the data at the earlier tiers. Uh, there's another reckon, uh, I don't code in Python either. Um, so there's a, if you want to learn, so there's a link for learning Python. Um, and so let me do a few questions that came from the, the, the chat. Um, sorry, I'm scrolling through to get back to it. Uh, Gail Henderson from University of North Carolina wanted to know, she was very impressed by the recruitment strategies. How do you respond when people ask about the representativeness, representativeness of your participants? And I believe what Gail's getting at is the, the goal of all of us to be reflective, but not um, trying to achieve perfect representativeness, can't say that word, in the epidemiologic sense. So, great question. For example, sometimes I get asked by people, do we have a target? For example, do we have a, are we trying to get our data set to be reflect like the things like the US census and other things? The answer is no. We're simply trying to make sure that our data set is, is reflective of the diversity. And that, so when I get asked about, do we have a benchmark that we're trying to get for the enrollment of, for example, African-Americans in our, in our data set, I say no, but we do want to make sure that we have a reflective population. And we, we, we do say that those that participate in our studies should be, should equal that of what you what you've seen at least in, of those populations represented in the census. So if we represent 13% of the, of the demographics, we wanna make sure that we're able to exceed that number in our representation in our studies. And in the chat was placed even another um, research all of us link about talking about this particular issue for those of you that have the same question that, that Gail did. Uh, Barbara Koenig uh, asks, uh, how does all of us describe ancestry of the genomic data set that was recently released? Does it include social categories as well as genetic ancestry? It does not, it, it, when you mean by social categories, you mean like the social construct of, I'm not sure what they mean by the social categories. I think knowing Barbara, I think that's what she means. And uh, Barbara has been um, uh, talking all through this uh, workshop about getting nomenclature and classification down. So I think she's uh, maybe asking about social categories such as race, as well as ancestral categories if they're if they're listed based on genome sequence. Right. right. So and, and also data by self-report, uh, as opposed to, you know, our, what, what, how do you get to that social category of race? Thank you for that question. Um, the social category of race is self-reported. So um, participants self-report their race. And we the, another thing that I get, didn't get a chance to say is that we also have access to EHR data as well. So participants who sign up for our study, in addition to the biological data that we collect through, through blood sample collection, urine and or saliva, we are then able to report back out ancestry data. So the, the racial information that we have is the self-reported racial and ethnic information and the information that we return back is ancestry data. So we've run a little bit over. Um, uh, Kevin Mintz, let's do this as the last question. Um, Kevin Mintz uh, wanted to know how all of us is engaging with disability communities. Thank you so much for that question. And this is an area that we have some growth to do, but we are part, one of our key partners is the American Association of Health and Disabilities. And we even, and they're working with us to ensure things like that we're doing outreach and engagement to ensure that there, there's access and availability for populations living with disability to access. For, for example, we have a mobile unit that goes out. When, we, when that mobile unit goes out, we're making sure that that mobile unit is available for persons living with certain types of disabilities. But we also have have the American Association of Health and Disability really assessing our database to assess it to ensure that there's access and equity issues there. Yeah, I wanna, I'm gonna, with the 
organizers' um, indulgence, I want to sneak one question in for uh, William Butler, and and then one advertisement for the All of Us program at the end. So, Leah, the um, question was how are you, how is the Unite program going to assess and measure culture change? It's always tough to, to know how to yeah. do that within an institution. Currently, we have established an evaluation committee um, in order to establish um, a baseline with regards to where we stand right now, um, identifying goals of where we're trying to get to, and so that we can um, be able to measure our success along, along the way. Um, so that is currently, that has been taken into consideration, and there is an evaluation committee to address that. Okay, thanks. And I want to... And um, uh, Kareem maybe didn't mention this, but all of us is target size is much larger than it's at now. Uh, the pandemic took a bit of a slowing down of recruitment and someone asked, how can I get involved? Uh, both my institution and as an individual, uh, the target size is roughly double or, or maybe triple or quadruple what it is now, depending on how funds hold out. And to be truly effective, uh, all of us really needs to get bigger. It's gonna be an amazing resource as it is now, um, but it's only going to get better. So I would direct people to the All of Us website, uh, and I'm sure somewhere- My team will put that in the chat. Um, yeah, how, a, how to get involved. Right. There's a, they'll put both in there, how you can get involved as an organization, then also as a researcher, how you can get access to our data through the, the three levels of access to that data. Okay, I, thanks to both speakers. Thank you for um, the explanation. I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Cho, who I think is taking the next session, and apologies for going a few minutes over, but thank you very much. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you, um, and thanks everyone for participating in this final session. Uh, I'd like to thank all the participants for their active participation and great contributions. Uh, together with Sandra Lee, it's been an absolute honor uh, to work with the NHGRR team to develop this agenda, uh, this really has surpassed all of our expectations. I'd like to thank the speakers, moderators, um, and participants of the breakout rooms. Uh, from Vince Bonham, uh, we heard about the critical importance of interweaving in all of genetics and genomics, uh, the concept of equity and all of equity research uh, through diversity, equity, inclusion. Um, I think everyone in this workshop understands the need for change. Uh, and we all recognize that change is hard. Uh, but against kind of that goal and aspiration, um, I think we, it's important for us to pause for a moment and understand how much substantial progress has been made, um, starting from hearing from investigators who have been here for many decades. Uh, it really does underline that substantial progress has, has been made, but that more progress is needed through policy changes, through funding priority changes, uh, evolving towards a more perfect a union. Uh, from President Hildreth, we heard about a number of issues regarding factors that, that modulate SDOH, uh, the importance of pharmacogenetics, the importance for capacity building. Um, and he very excitingly summarized for us um, a, a tremendous transformational new initiative of Together for Change, Together between the Harry and Howard. And really, I think what could be a theme for this is defining and establishing trusted partners uh, to kind of recruit and uh, 500,000 participants. From Jen Wojcik, we heard about uh, very intriguingly about kind of what are the factors that we accept and what kind of factors are rewarded in terms of understanding and shaping research and science. Um, really puts an emphasis on epidemiology and prevalence. Uh, Dr. Wojcik uh, underscored the complexity of Hispanic uh, Latino populations and really the need such as with all of us and Unite for these long-term investments to generate this very rich and very broad set of information um, and ultimately uh, assuring accountability to the communities uh, that we are all serving. In our panel on structural uh, features, we heard about the importance of system designs who's at the table, who asks the questions, uh, giving examples of gene environment inter interactions. We all here believe that education kind of is the answer, but we have to make sure that the barriers, uh, that education never serves as a barrier to this. Um, and we heard about the importance of trust and honesty um, and benefits uh, to the community. And it's not like the researcher being separated from the community, but actually being part of, of the community. Uh, and really breaking down these barriers between research and clinical care 
and really making this all of one of a point together. Um, so um, with that, uh, with the breakout rooms, kind of the task for each of the breakout groups uh, was to uh, establish 10 questions um, that we have now kind of combined a little bit, tweaked a little bit. Um, and so for these 10 questions, um, we're only gonna give you two minutes to vote on one particular priority that you think is the most important priority. So I'll now I hand this off to Lucia uh, to review this for the group. So Lucia. Okay, thank you, buddy. I'm gonna launch this poll. There's one question. And the idea is that everyone will select the recommendation that they think is the most important for NHGRI to consider when developing future research opportunities in genomics and health equity. So we're really just using this to take a pulse for where um, people's thoughts and enthusiasm are. We'll leave the poll open for about two minutes. Can I just confirm, um, are people seeing the poll? Yes. Judy, do you see it? Oh, okay, great. Yes, so just, just choose one. Just choose one option. Okay, I see a few brave souls voting. Numbers are going up, this is great. Okay, I think the numbers are more or less stable. Judy, would you like me to go ahead and show yeah, the please. results? Sure. Okay, let's see if I can do this, share results. All right, are you all seeing this? It's not, it's not exactly ordered from most to least, but it looks like the most common was to diversify the genomics workforce by targeting HBCUs, uh, MSIs, tribal colleges, community colleges, um, et cetera. And then the second most common one was ensure sufficient time and equitable resource distribution and funding um, for community-based research. So Judy, any additional comments you would like to make on the survey? No, no, I think this is um, a terrific. I think it actually does reflect kind of the thoughts. Um, kind of the workforce issues starting early, um, I, I think does reflect kind of the conversations that I've heard throughout this. Um, so in terms of kind of closing out, um, I think the plans that NHGRI is again, and has been stated multiple times is that all of the comments from the chats um, have been captured from the breakout rooms and all the panels. Uh, one of the things that I think is truly unique about NHGRI among all the NIH institutes is the extent to which uh, researcher and community engagement is um, not just encouraged, but is kind of central and primary. Um, and I think a lot of the work of this workshop has been possible uh, through this. Um, and then in terms of um, uh, kind of next steps, uh, we are planning to write this up as a meeting report to try to capture all of the comments uh, from the community. Um, and write this up as a meeting report and disseminate uh, the recordings uh, to the community broadly. So Lucia, I don't know if you have last words. Sure, so on behalf of my co-chair Ebony, Madden and myself, we wanted to thank everyone um, who's here and, and those who participated yesterday but um, are not here today for devoting your time and energy and expertise to this workshop. We've, we've seen and heard throughout the importance of partnerships, cross-disciplinary partnerships, community partnerships, industry partnerships, institutional partnerships. And we just wanna say thanks for being our partners and getting this conversation going. It's been a real privilege to convene so many people with so much different experience um, and um, guidance for us going forward. As Judy mentioned, we have heard recommendations in a number of important areas. Um, and so we're um, wanting to incorporate your perspectives and recommendations in a meeting summary. Also share um, online when we have that in addition to uh, writing it up and hopefully submitting it to a journal. Um, we will also at NHGRI consider these recommendations for development of funding agendas. As always, you can contact us at NHGRI with your suggestions at any time. We also wanna note that NHGRI staff will be um, monitoring the chat. So if you have any final comments or questions, please go ahead and put those in there. Um, and then finally, we wanna give a special thank you to our fantastic, amazing co-chairs, Sandra Sujin Lee and Judy Cho, um, as well as the rest of our NHGRI planning committee, 
the session speakers, moderators, and panelists. And we want to give a special shout out to our NHGRI IT staff, without whom none of this could really happen. And they they really um, helped us out in some tight situations today. So special thanks to um, Makul Narukar and especially Gerald Samani for making this all happen. So I think we're ready to close out um, the workshop. So thank you all for coming. We really appreciate it.